Welcome back to the Tank Museum Bobbington and part two of our tour of the Cruiser Tank Mark II, the A-10. And I'm starting off at the commander's position. And this is a very impressive tank by 1940 standards. You gotta feel king of the world in something as big as this. Now the hatch is a two-piece affair, opens forwards and backwards as you can see. Provides a little bit of bulletproof protection when you're standing up uh, as you're scanning the battlefield ahead of you. And uh, you'll see why in a moment, but you really do want to be heads out on this tank in battle if you have a choice. Uh, the periscope does mount, as you can see, into the top of the forward mount of the split hatch. So that said, the only other thing I'll call your attention to is the height of the turret ring or the collar, which as near as I can tell, because there aren't really any obstructions that it's trying to clear, exists purely to lift up the entire turret a little bit to give a little bit more room inside for the turret basket. That said, let's start the tour of the inside. Moving down into the turret itself is sort of a good news and bad news story. Now part of the good news is that because you have the outward slope all the way up of the hull sides, this allows for quite a wide turret ring, which means that you can have a three-man turret with the crew in a standard configuration of commander and gunner on one side and loader on the other. Add to that the fact that it is a powered system and there is a full turret basket, uh, this is a, it's not the first such uh, tank, I believe the Soviets beat them with the T-28, but this is still quite an advanced concept for the time. Of note, I do note that the turret floor is uh, wood, and there is supposed to be a little bit of thin aluminium sheet metal going on top of that. The commander's seat, however, is a little bit unfortunate. Now, I am seated on a folding seat. There is a platform beneath me to stand on, of course, to a sticking my head out, which, given the total lack of vision, is going to be most of the time. My left foot apparently is supposed to go here because there is a footrest right next to the gunner's seat on the left-hand side, and I can only imagine that even a shorter gun uh, commander is going to have a little bit of an issue. Vision, as I say, is absolutely horrendous. The only way I can see out on this thing is when I close the hatch, there is that one rotating periscope to my front, and that is it. Uh, the saving grace is that that hatch lid is bulged upwards. It allows me a little bit more headroom. Uh, as you can see, my head is currently about level with the roof of the turret, so if you imagine a shorter gentleman, he should be quite happy. Uh, and uh, the periscope is a little bit raised up higher so what limited visibility you have is at least a bit better. Initial communications for the commander were very limited. There weren't any. And I'm not quite sure how we would talk to the driver. However, soon afterwards, the Tenoi system was installed and you could also communicate on the wireless system, which was behind in the bustle, either a number nine or a number 11 for long distance communications or a number 14 for shorter distance. Outside of that, the commander doesn't really have a lot to do except just stick his head at the top, hold on, and yell a lot. So that said, let us move forward to the gunner seat. So here we are in the gunner seat and it isn't bad. Uh, at least as defined by, I've been sitting here for 25 minutes and we've been setting up the cameras and lights and I am not yet in pain which by the standards of 1940 is pretty good. And I would like to think that your typical height gunner of the time would have his left leg a little bit further clear of the power traverse handle, and he will be a lot more comfortable for at least moderate durations of period. Now, I should also take advantage of this uh, opportunity of space to mention and pain uh, that I am not the only person sacrificing my body in these videos and uh, my poor old cameraman Andre has been bashing his head and so on inside here as well, so spare a thought for him as well. He's almost my size, he's a bit bulkier, a little shorter. And back to the gunner's position. So, Traverse is either manual, which is, uh, I have to say, actually a very light system, it's very easy to traverse this thing, uh, or power by use of the handle, and you would select it by use of a toggle switch here. The power traverse system on this thing was fantastic. A full traverse would take 10 seconds at maximum speed. But if you wanted a really fine lay at the slowest possible speed, it would take 24 minutes to do a full 360, at least according to the manual. 
Elevation, well, that depended on what kind of gun you had. If you had the two-pounder, which was, of course, the typical uh, gun of a British tank of the era, you had that traditional shoulder harness that you would be aiming uh, by simple upper body strength. The 37 Mortar, however, comes with a good old-fashioned gearing system, and it also is very well balanced and quite easy to adjust up or down. If you had the 3.7, while well, your standard loadout was going to be smoke with a couple of HE rounds. If you had the 2-pounder, well, in that case, you've got about 100 rounds of ammunition, although most of it was armor piercing. And the definition of close support for a tank back then was, you know, you're obscuring the enemy uh, for your general soft skin work or personnel. Well, that's why you have the coax or bow machine gun. At least that was the thinking. Otherwise, the two-pounder was a great gun for the era, just not very great at general purpose. To look at, it's got a couple of choices. First choice is he has a gap in the armor. And uh, it literally doesn't seem to be a gap. I don't see any mounting for uh, glass or perspex or anything else like that. To open it, it seems a little bit convoluted, but you have this wire cable comes up over a pulley system to this little system here, and you pull it down and up it comes. It seems a bit excessive, uh, but I do note that it is quite a thick block of metal in there, so perhaps for leverage purposes it's a lot easier and more reliable to do it that way. The alternative is either the main sight for either the main gun or the coaxial base up. Anyway, overall the gunner is pretty well sorted in this tank. It's uh, quite advanced in terms of its capabilities and design. And although it is a little bit cramped, well, A, if you're a shorter gunner, it's not an issue, and B, well, in 1940, you didn't know any better what could be possible, and by the standards of a lot of other tanks from that time that I've been in, this is actually very good indeed. So anyway, over to the loader side. Loader side, well sure, he's quite comfortable as well, I have to say, because there's nothing else in here with him. Now, what does he have? Well, he has the base of machine gun to his front, and there would be a large metal bin for the uh, shell casings or whatever to be caught into. Um, I'm also noticing that there is a sort of a chamfered wedge at the bottom that the base simply slides into the mounting. Very clever, there's no, it's not held in place by a pin per se, it's just wedged in there. The ammunition is scattered around, in this case, of course, the 3.7. You've got vertical stowage down here on the whole side. So you've got horizontal stowage a little bit forward. You've got horizontal a little bit behind. Even the seat that he is seated on is a stowage for rounds of ammunition. Now, a point that I'm noticing here is that this is not a loader's hatch. This is the emergency door. And what it has in it is a gap here with a housing overhang. So the, there is not ceiling here, air can escape up and out. And this appears to be the form of ventilation because I don't actually see a ventilation fan anywhere. So that's my assumption. How do I know it is an emergency door? Well, because this little device back here says so. It says it must be closed before you can raise the signaling lamp. And I have to say, I don't remember ever seeing a, a device like this in a tank before. And it, it's kind of clever. It makes a bit of sense if you want to send out you know, some sort of a signal without advertising on the radio waves where you are or if your radio isn't working or present. Uh, obviously, you would have to shield it a little bit to make sure the light is going the right direction. But it comes on this little mounting slide here. So close the emergency door, raise your lamp, and away you go. Now, the last thing I'll say while I'm here is that I may have done the gunner seat a slight disservice. I did figure out that it goes up and down, and I adjusted it before filming that sequence. But now that I'm looking at it from the other side, I see it will adjust rearwards as well, although not easily. You've got to go after it with a spanner or a wrench, if you, depending where you're from. Move it backwards or forwards to the appropriate position and then spanner it back down again. Now, just how much further back the gunner could go and the commander still retain the use of his leg is an open question. Next up, the front hull. So the front hull of the tank, and well, I'm just going to knock out both positions at once. If you look over to the bow gunner side, you can see more or less how the seat is, just more or less on the floor of the hull. Uh, and it is hinged, so you do have that little 
um, stowage effect as well. The base to his front, it is a big weapon. He has the direct vision telescope to the left, and he also has another of those sliding blocks angled a little bit off to the front left as well. Driver's side initially is not bad. Um, I am seated reasonably comfortably, and my left foot is very easily able to operate the clutch, my right foot, the accelerator. The control tailors, bless them, they are in the middle. So they do not interfere with my ability to use my feet. Uh, the crash gearbox, five speed is on the right. It's a uh, grand total of 16 miles an hour going forwards. Reverse speed is even lower than first gear. So it's even slower than first gear. And even first gear was only to be used for emergencies or particularly hazardous conditions. So guaranteed you can go backwards. The problem with the driver's side though is getting out. They've it shifted me a little bit inboard to make room for the fuel tank, which is on the left here. Unfortunately, they have not shifted the hatch, which is far off to the left. So the edge of the hatch right now is just to the left of my ear, which means that to get out, you have to kind of scoot sideways and then up and out. But opening the hatch door is not easy because it is unsprung. It's a sort of a folding accordion shape that you fold upwards, inwards, and push and flip forward which is a little bit difficult given the, you know, the angle of leverage you're at. But then again, the motivation of impending death, if you don't get out, uh, will add you a little bit of strength. To see out, he's got a couple of choices. Uh, obviously, in low threat environments, you have the entire rectangular visor, which will swing open. Uh, for combat purposes, he does have a single periscope, which at least is adjustable in elevation and terrain. Uh, and should that be knocked out, uh, the emergency backup, and it seems to be frozen in place, is some very simple armored slits. And that's kind of like a super emergency, but it works. The dials and knobs and switches are scattered around. The speedo is down by my knee. There's a Smith rev counter. When the mechanics were opening this up for us, uh, they were fawning over the rev counter and the fact that the fuse box is one of those typical classic fuse boxes. And of course, the remaining uh, items on the panel are over the left shoulder. And that is basically it for the driver. So time to get out. All in all, A10, I think, was a fair effort. It was pretty solid for the time. The powered three-man turret was reasonably well armed, and you had a radio in every tank, so your level of overall offensive capability was quite good. On the other hand, you have a tank that is still riveted. It's a little slow and of questionable reliability. About 175 of the vehicles were made before production moved on to bigger and better things. They saw service with the British Expeditionary Force in France and Belgium, and as late as mid-1941 could be found fighting in North Africa and Greece. Although by this point it's approaching obsolescence, and the fact that any survivors were still running at the end of the day was a matter of jubilation. The tank did have a close relation in the infantry tank Mark III, and of course cruiser production went on to the A-13 Mark I and II, the cruisers III and IV. As for the Valentine, well, that's a story for another day, but just look at the hull below the upper superstructure. You see the V-shape and the running gear have a very definite similarity. Until then, I hope you found the tour of the A-10 Cruiser 2 interesting and informative. And as ever, I'll see you on the next one.